All right, welcome to the podcast. On today's show, we're talking to Jason, CEO of Malk. Thanks for joining. For people who don't know, what does the company do? Malk is a clean, organic, plant-based product. Uh, we pride ourselves in putting only ingredients you can find in your grocery store. I'm a little familiar with the almond milk space. Yes. Just being a connoisseur, and I'm an investor in a company, but, but more so just like I just love it and a fan, and I just prefer it in general. The hardest part about almond milks, and one of them, when you, when you guys are choosing like the no binders, no gums option, is getting this thing to be shelf stable, mm-hmm. right? And so what, is, what was that whole journey like? How did you get there? How did you arrive at where you're at today? So today we only have two of our SKUs that are shelf stable. Okay. And we just launched those in the Tetra packaging format right here. Yeah. So we just launched these two guys. Everything else is cold chain. To, okay. to your point, that is one of the biggest challenges. Yeah. And the reality is consumers prefer it cold chain, just like dairy milk. If you look at the size of the categories, it's almost a $3 billion category refrigerated. It's like $750 million as shelf stable in the center of the store. Wow. So for us, we wanted to wait to establish ourselves in refrigerated and then introduce ourselves to those shoppers that are shopping center store yeah. and give them that organic clean ingredient option. That's smart. And just in terms of like when you guys came to market to where that was, that was a shift in some way. I would uh, say it's a build. Or was it? would you say it was like the, the obvious play? For us, we saw the opportunity. We want to support and ignite people's personal wellness and lifestyle journeys. We're not the panacea. We're not the end-all, be-all, fix everything. But if people are choosing to have a dairy alternative, we believe they should have one that's clean, simple ingredients, and organic. And that didn't exist over in Shelf Stable. And we had grown our team with the bandwidth that we could actually go develop it and get it to market and sell it in. So it was finally time for us to add on to our business. You've been CEO for 10 years of this business, roughly. I've been CEO for three years now. Three years, okay. So I joined uh, three and a half years ago as a consultant, had the opportunity to step into the role and to, to help nurture this brand forward. Sorry, Our, sorry, the company's been around for almost 10 years. Yeah. Correct, yes, sir. When I think about Alt Milks, let's say in 2012, okay. right? Brand new, really interesting. There was an explosion to some extent. What have you seen in your time dealing with this industry as it relates to the consumer behavior around milks, around alternative milks, and where is it today? What's exciting is people are continuing to shift and people are becoming more aware of how they're choosing to nourish their bodies. And that's what excites us. We launched a marketing campaign called Turn It Around because we want people to look at our ingredients and our competitors' ingredients. Yeah. Not just for us. Look at the ingredients that you put in your house. Yeah. I have an 11-year-old daughter. I've got a 7-year-old son. And having the conversation with them to say, take a look. What are the ingredients? Can you pronounce them? Can you read them? Is that what you want to nourish your body with? Mm-hmm. If you can't pronounce it, what is it? Understand what it is. And if it's not doing good for your body, then walk away from it. Yeah. And it's shifted the way that we've actually shopped in our house, the way that we cook in our house. So that's a long way of saying consumers are looking for healthier options. Mm-hmm. And it's exciting to be a part of that trend to, to meet them where they are. The thing that was always crazy to me is like when Oatly came out, they made this huge splash. And I think if you're in the wellness space, so here we are in Los Angeles, Right, and so everyone's super cognizant of what the things they put in their body, much more than most places around the country. Mm-hmm. And so, almost like cutting edge in some way. Yeah. And then Oatly comes out, and there's tons of gums and tons of binders. But the the issue is Oatly spending a tremendous amount of capital, a lot of money. They're deploying tons of money marketing into coffee shops, and and national tele, like everywhere. And people were buying into it, you know. And then all of a sudden, the more healthy options start going away at coffee shops because Oatly's doing. Whether it's smart or not, they're doing. They're spending a lot of money getting their product into these coffee shops and ultimately meeting the consumer where they are, let's say. And then that's helping out with sales. But to me, when I saw that, I was like, there's got to be an equal p- response. There's got to be a company mm-hmm. that gets equal amount of financing or something, right? And then just goes after them on this exact thing. And so you guys launched a campaign going after Oatly and Califia, right? And you're mentioning this. Is it... From your perspective, one, I love the decision. Kudos to do that. Like, I love the offense of that. I don't think enough CEOs play offense. A lot of them play defense for obvious reasons, and I get it, but it, as an entrepreneur, it bothers me. So kudos to you for, for taking that on. What has the response been like? Like, do consumers get it? So we were just at Expo West a few weeks ago, and we always have some of our, our cheeky campaign slides up there, and it is phenomenal to engage with consumers in their response. Mm-hmm. So as we've launched the campaign, as we point out, you know, we've listed ingredients of competitors and marked them all out and said, hey, competitor X, we fixed your label for you. It's now just oats, water, and salt like we have. And for people, they're so caught up in the marketing, to your point, when you deploy that much capital, it's hard not to dig in deeper. 
In fact, that brand in particular calls the ingredient side of their packaging the boring side. No, no, that's the most important side. They call it that? It is the boring side on the side of their packaging. That's hilarious. So, you know, they're deterring people from looking at it. They kind of own it in that way. They own it to an extent. That's interesting. I didn't consider that. Okay. for us, as we look at it, it's like, you know what? We are authentically us. We are authentically clean, simple, organic ingredients. And that's who we are, who we have always been, and who we will always be. We don't have the capital to deploy hundreds of millions of dollars in order to, to buy shelf space, to you know, shoehorn ourselves into coffee shops. That's okay, because we want to authentically connect with our consumers. And what we've seen, especially starting here in Southern California, yeah. is a groundswell of support. Yeah. It's been phenomenal. Yeah, the consumers definitely get it here. They when do. it comes to coffee shops, what, what's the strategy there? Do you guys have any coffee shops that you're working with, or do you primarily go the consumer, meet them where they are? So right now we're not in food service. Yeah. That is a, a branch that, you know, it's in the consideration set. The challenge is baristas want things to froth up. Yeah. On oat products, yeah. the main ingredient in the oat that's frothing is the oils. Yeah. We have no oils. Yeah, I love this. Uh, we should clip this also because the thing that gets me is like when you see all this beautiful – these swans on the cappuccino, yeah. you know, it's like an Oatly. What they did when they launched is they would have these, uh, like these, they were called like coffee throwdowns or something. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. And they, we actually had one in here in this room and it was interesting, but I was like, my almond milk doesn't froth like that. Like I can't make a swan. I can't make, first of all, I'm not talented enough to make anything, <laughs> but I certainly can't make a swan with, you can't with a clean milk. You can, Ours you can, does you, you froth. can get close, but it's you, not, yes, you're it's right. not, uh, Without yeah. the gums in the almond milk and without the oils in the oat milk, it becomes a bigger challenge. Yeah. So then it goes back to, do you want the swan? Or that's right. Or do you want something that's not going to disrupt your gut and have you hurting tomorrow? That's right. So choices have to be made. Yeah. The one thing that someone said to me one time when they looked at the back of uh, one of your competitors is essentially, this is what some people start their day with. Mm-hmm. And it was like offensive. You know, some people put these things in their body as the first thing they put in their body or their kids' bodies, yes. right? With cereal and things like that. It's offensive to some people. It is, especially as you start to go down the path of why are we having more ADHD in this world? Why do we have more you know, distracted children? If we go back and we just look at the sugar that we're pouring into them yeah. or have the potential to pour into them, what are we doing? If, what if we shifted the entire metric and said, we're going to start our kids with a protein based breakfast. That's going to nourish them throughout the day Mm -hmm. with clean, simple ingredients. What would happen to our classrooms? My wife's an educator by trade. So she's seen, you know, over the last 15, 20 years, just the dynamic of more and more kids are being challenged. They've got more support in school because they have situations that they're bringing in. So it's, it's definitely top of mind as a parent, first and foremost. I mean, yeah. I've, I have it on my LinkedIn. I'm a husband, I'm a father, and the CEO of Malk Organics. And I do that intentionally Yeah, because that's where my priority is. That's right. I was just talking to a doctor before I got here, actually, and he was saying that we were talking about testosterone levels going mm-hmm. down in men today. And they were saying it's, uh, a big part of that was, is plastic. It's basically yeah. the plastics that enter your body, specifically from coffee. Hot liquids in plastic mm-hmm. uh, have a, just a way of disrupting your body. I don't know. It was really interesting. I hadn't considered it, but... Interesting. And so obviously what's in that cup also matters. When, when you took over as CEO, what was the company like at that time? So how many products did you guys have? What were the sales like? Yeah, when I came in in, in late 2020, we self-manufactured. Okay. We had 14 SKUs. Okay. And That's a lot. Wow. It was a lot for 14 the size SKUs of the company. self-manufacturing. That's a, okay. So there was there so a f- lot of spray, let's call it. Spray and pray? Spray and pray. Yeah. But they were fantastic. They tasted great and they were authentic to who we are. And the challenge was as I stepped in, my task was build a business plan that allows us to meet consumers where they are today and where they're going tomorrow. Mm-hmm. And to Just do focus that. focus it in. 100%. So we yeah. cut 14 down to three. Okay. If you look here on the table now, yeah. we're a lot more than three you got again. a bunch. And we've got the sales commiserate to warrant it. We've got the distribution network. We've got the production facility partnership. So we don't self-manufacture anymore. We co-manufacture because there are experts out there. Mm-hmm. What we know we do a really good job of is developing great product and making sure consumers know about it. Okay. So that's our focus in order to expand out to consumers everywhere. What was the transition like with the, with the, with the, I guess the founder, was that easy? Uh, is the founder still involved? What's, what was that patch like? It can always be so, it's so many feelings, emotions. We've talked to so many CEOs who, you know, a board comes in or founders and they replace them. And sometimes it's super chill. 
sometimes difficult. It can get rocky. Yeah, I had the opportunity to sit down with the founder, and there was there was a short transition, uh, and you know it was a phenomenal conversation, and there was an alignment that and trust that understanding who the brand is and what it means, mm -hmm. and to carry that forward, and we've remained true to that. It launched in a farmer's market, yeah. right? It's small, it's hometown, it's launched in Houston, Texas. The only thing I've done is move the operations to or move the, the headquarters to Austin. But we are still, you know, we're a Texas-born company, and we're excited to be out here meeting consumers' needs. And when you got involved, how much money had the company raised at that time? We don't have all that published. Uh, we'd, okay. we'd gone but you through were like a, a round, amount. a couple. Correct. We nope. got through a round, and I brought a couple rounds in since then. Okay, so you're like at a C round now. You guys just closed a round. We, we right? just closed a B two round. Yeah, just to okay. Follow on. What was that like? That was, it was fun. Uh, it was fun. A lot fun. of cold plunging? <laughs> there, yes. A lot of uh, mentally. <laughs> yeah. Mental toughness Mondays were always my favorite in the cold plunge, getting ready for the week. We've got a phenomenal board. We've got a phenomenal group of investors that, you know, they're the ones that initially brought me in. And, you know, as we continue to put a business plan in front of them and hit the business plan, they continue to believe and support it. My favorite saying, though, is paper doesn't refuse ink, and I've updated that to say, and Excel doesn't refuse keystrokes. Mm -hmm. So any plan we put out there is going to be wrong in some way, shape, or form. That's true. But the best thing is they've supported the build-out of the team that we needed to get to where we are. They've supported the projections and, and the path forward which we're going, the SKU expansion, mm -hmm. going from three back up to where we're, we're headed here at the end of this year. Yeah. So that support and empowerment has been phenomenal. And then to be able to build and curate the team that we have, it starts with culture. You know that it, it's yeah. culture first, yeah. bringing in the right people. I still interview everybody that comes in the company. We're over 30 employees now. And to make sure that you're gonna be accretive to the business and accretive to the culture. Because when you're accretive to the culture, the business will exponentially grow. And we've seen that. That's true. So what I love about the story is, is basically what you're saying is when you became CEO, there was a, there was a lot of things going on, uh, almost a lack of focus. And so let's go back to the hero products, mm -hmm. get three, may, maybe even scale down to, or your production. I don't know. But I guess you, you could, it could have been an option. Either way, you do that. You make sure the three works. And now you got your hero products out there. And now you're just expanding with money in the bank yes. with, uh, I guess, a more proven track record around sales Correct. and velocities. It took us time to make sure as we shifted out of self-manufacturing to co-manufacturing that we delivered the exact same product. Yeah. And that took us yeah. honestly That's longer hard. than I thought. Especially for, your, for this product in particular. When you have three ingredients, there's only so many dials you can turn to get it to where it needs to be. Yeah. So that transition took us almost nine months. Were you guys like creating science when you guys did that? Because it's tough what you're trying to achieve. It so, is tough. And so was there like, and I asked that seriously, like yeah. I really don't know, but was there at the beginning like, oh, this didn't exist, this temperature play, I don't even know what, I'm just making things up, but was there a world where you guys were literally creating a new way of doing this, of a shelf-stable product? There's not a new manufacturing process, but we did have to lean on heavily on some partners in the, in the product development space to make sure that we understood how do we maneuver this from a cold press, high pressure processing environment mm -hmm. to an ESL extended shelf life. Cause when we self manufactured, we were at 45 days of shelf life. When it went in the bottle, it got to the distributors at 36 days. Mm -hmm. okay. Okay. And as we evolved the process, we have safely been able to maintain the integrity of the product with a one year shelf life, okay. which has allowed us to go talk to different retailers and say, you don't have to worry about the shelf life. You don't have to worry about running out of stock because you've got, you know, 21 days when it hits your store shelf. Okay. And it also gives consumers that opportunity that, hey, I can actually go buy a couple bottles and I know it's gonna be good in my fridge. Yeah. And so in that world, you look at a lever as just like the distribution of it. 100%. That becomes a big one. It, that was the biggest barrier to expansion That's outside so of the natural channel. Yeah, just getting it into the hands of your retailers as fast as possible. Well, you can imagine in, yeah, in wow. doing that with a very short shelf life, totally. the logistics cost, yeah. you know, you go from pallets and rainbow pallets of various products to full truckloads of single products. Yeah. And it allows us to scale at that dynamic. From a marketing perspective, Oatly came in, they, they crushed the market for a while. Yeah. And so I think everyone was requesting. I saw it here with this coffee shop in front of us. Like I, got the, I, got, I see the data, so to speak. And so mm -hmm. oat milks became sort of the go-to for a little while. It got kind of weird. And now it's going away again. Uh, but what do you guys see in terms of like your data? Like, did you see when Oatly came in that there was a 
inflection, there was some sort of hit, and now you're seeing it level back out. So it's interesting because as consumers are looking at the packages, they're actually starting to look at the ingredients and they're going, why do I have all of these oils in my product? They're wholesale walking away. Yeah. There are consumers that were oat consumers that have shifted back to almond. Mm -hmm. There's some that have shifted back to dairy, which is an interesting dynamic to watch. I see that here. And so they didn't have, all, they didn't have anything but alt milks at this coffee shop. Yeah. And now they added milk. And so it's like the consumer just seems confused. <laughs> it's a really interesting thing. So if we think about the and we're in West Hollywood, California, right? So it's like also exactly. you would think this is kind of like the epicenter of where people are making, but again, cutting edge. And so maybe this is, this is data to some extent. Maybe, maybe there's a reason people are going back to dairy. Yes. And that's our opportunity to educate them that there is a clean oat. Yeah. There is a clean oat product you can have in your coffee. You can have it in your cereal. You don't have to worry about the glyphosate, the gluten, any of those dynamics. There's no oils. There's no fillers. And it's an education opportunity for us. And if oat does retract some in size, it'll, I don't believe it'll ever go away. Mm -hmm. But if it retracts, great. That's an opportunity for us to go talk to those consumers and say, this is the one you should be consuming. Have you guys seen it retract? It has retracted it has, over the right? last six months, especially. Yeah. I know they got in a little bit of trouble. There was some bad press around mm -hmm. one of their investor groups. But it's interesting when a player like that comes in because there's two sides of it. One side of the coin is they're telling the world what to have. The other side of the coin is the world will then ask more questions. Yes. <laughs> so it kind of it kind of plays ni nicely for for the cleaner version. We love it when other people bring people to the category, right? And That's then we'll exactly educate right. them in the space. That's a good way of putting it. When it comes to other marketing things that you're excited about for this year. What can you tell us? You know, it's exciting because we're launching a lot of new products. Yeah. Uh, we're bringing back Cashew, which we had four years ago. as one that I had to make the hard decision to cut off. Okay. We've launched in Tetra. And we've got a pumpkin spice coming, That's which awesome. we're excited about for a seasonal. And then really the coup de grace for us is we are bringing creamers to the, the market. Okay. And they are clean ingredients. Are they dairy creamers? No, no. They're almond and oat creamer. Wow. So these creamers don't have any natural flavors. They're organic. They use coconut sugar for the sweetener. So it is something that you can actually add to your coffee and feel really good about it yeah. and not be concerned of, you know, what, why am I, whatever this flavor is. So we've got caramel, we've got a vanilla, and we've got a lightly sweetened oat. Yeah. It's true to what it is. We, you know, is there anything like that on the, on the market today? There's not. The, wow. the ones that have come out have natural flavors, and we had our own run-in with natural flavors. That was my first fail with Malk is uh, we did some consumer testing as we were dialing in the formula. Yeah. And when we launched our, our product in November of 21, we had natural flavors in it. Okay. And consumers said, you are absolutely going to kill this brand. Educate me on natural flavors because you're saying the word natural yes. and I'm hearing natural. And then you're saying flavors and that doesn't seem controversial. What, so what was the problem? Yeah. Even organic natural flavors, you acquire it from a flavor house okay. and it is a proprietary formula. So you don't know you what's, don't know in, what's it. in it. Got it. Interesting. That's the dynamic. And for that's a, amazing for a brand that stands about we're transparent on who we are. We messed up. It's on me. I heard consumers want more vanilla. Great. We'll dial it up. That wasn't what they wanted. They wanted the organic vanilla extract that we've used. So it started hitting the market, and this all hit the Monday after Thanksgiving. Okay. When was it? What year was this? This was 2021. Okay. By that Friday, we had a new formula approved, which we make today. <laughs> so the response was it hot, came in hot. It came in hot. We, you know, we had a crisis team on it, including the board. So it was all hands on deck, and it was a, what did we do? You always learn more from failure than you do from success. Yeah. And it was... That's it, kind of beautiful. It is beautiful. It gave us clarity. It cemented the brand. 100%. And you heard it from the people that mattered the most. And we talked to phenomenal influencers like Vani Hari, um, Kelly Levesque. We talked to a lot of um, influencers out there. It's like, what are you doing? Wow. And we took a step back and, you know, sometimes you have to be above the business instead of in the business. They're like, yeah, we screwed up. You know what? We're going to fix this. And we did. And that's the beauty of being a small company versus larger companies that just pour marketing dollars. They wouldn't have been able to pivot like that. Yeah. And that's allowed us with that clarity and understanding that we are first and foremost, organic, clean, simple ingredients, fully transparent. Good for you. And so you were a new CEO at that time, Correct. to some extent. This yeah. is kind of one of your first things. I was in the seat for, you know, nine months at the time. Oof. What was that? <laughs> Did you think doomsday? Were you like, this is over for me? I needed the cold plunge back then. <laughs> I had not got into cold plunging yet. That oh was, uh, yeah, of course that thought comes into play. Yeah. Wow. Well, good for you. But also, I really, I mean, the response of the of your people is also amazing. Like, that's a, 
of the consumer yeah. to really sh share that they care that much. And they did. And in a way that was not, you know, we're going to destroy you. It's, Hey, fix this. Fix it. Can, yeah. can you go fix this? You screwed up. Yeah. Don't screw up again. How big is the creamer market as you guys launch this product? So what we're excited, plant-based creamers continue to grow. Okay. And we see that as an opportunity. So it's still a young category. Still a young category. Okay. Yeah. There, you know, there's a lot of entrance in there. But again, gums, oils, fillers, natural flavors. Yeah. And where consumers want to be is have this clean ingredient option. So as we've developed and launched, as we're launching this come June of 2024, yeah. we're excited to, to meet consumers in that space. And how much is it? How much are you guys are you launching at? So we'll be launching uh, across Whole Foods, Sprouts, and many other retailers that are in process right now confirming. And for, I mean, like for the how much to, oh, for someone to buy it? So the creamers are going to be between six ninety nine and seven ninety nine. Okay. And how much is the uh, the other stuff here? The the regular bottles. So the regular bottles are in that same price point. Oh yep. no way. Yep, six ninety nine, seven ninety nine, depending on the the retailer. Okay. The creamer market. That's an interesting play. I hadn't considered it. Are there any other players doing not so much this in the creamer market, but when it comes to the no fillers uh, in the grocery store. There are. You can look across categories. Even within plant-based milks, there's other people that are emulating us and, and they're creating their own iteration. Yeah. And it, it's really an interesting marketing dynamic because if you have your main line and you say, I've got all these products and I'm going to launch this clean ingredient one. Why are you just doing that with a few of them instead of the whole array? Yeah. But when it comes to like a moat, Mm -hmm. that you guys have as your business today, obviously yes. evolving. I think moving to the creamer sort of expands the moat, the smart play. What do you view as your moat today as the world exists? So fluid alt-based milks. So as we look at that, you know, be it in creamers, be it in milks, be it in shelf stable, that's a world that where we believe we just nail it. And we can own that and consumers vote with their pocketbooks at the end of the day. Mm -hmm. And we continue, as we launch new retailers, we hit and exceed expectations. So it, it proves our theory that it's not just the natural foods consumer that wants this. It is consumers across all chains and all retailers. Mm -hmm. So what I'm excited about, other brands are coming and emulating it. That's great. Yeah. Because the rising tide lifts all ships. That's right. As we move more brands outside of our category mm -hmm. across the store to clean, simple ingredients, as a society, will we get healthier? I think so. Yeah. I mean, I'm speaking as a guy that spent most of his life well over 300 pounds. I didn't choose to start a health journey until I was 39 years old. And as I look at it now, how can I influence my children? Mm -hmm. How can I help launch a product? It's the first brand I've ever been a part of, Diego, where I can say, kids, have as much as you want. Mm -hmm. I've been in packaged meats, beverage, alcohol, frozen food. And to have the responsibility more than anything to lead a company that can actually help our country become healthier. That's a big burden. It's a big burden. But yeah. I'm excited to be a part of it. I love that. It's meaningful. It's it purposeful is. to you. Yeah. When you think about just the industry as a whole. So at the end, you put your CEO hat on, where is this all going? Do you think like, so I'll give you an example. When I talk to some friends of mine that are investors in, in crazy, like the future of food space, yeah. you know, they always say uh, an example will be, they're starting to grow breast milk in labs. And so the future for them, it sounds crazy, but the yeah. future for them is, you know, who knows when this is, but effectively in five years time, you go to a coffee shop and you're ordering like your breast milk cappuccino and it's from a lab, but you know, all the nutrients, that, all the stuff. Interesting, you know, and I think about that, like what does that mean even, even to consider that the future might have coffee shops is an interesting consideration in that example. Mm -hmm. When you guys think about, obviously this is, you're probably done and exiting by then, I hope. But when you think about the future yeah. of what you guys are working towards, right? So here you have a creamer. Where do you think it goes? Or what, what are some of the things that are maybe on your three, five-year plan? You know, anywhere that we can have a, a meaningful impact to what consumers eat mm -hmm. and we okay. can help make something clean. You're saying simple. a lot there. You're saying a lot there, Jason. It's a broad <laughs> spectrum. I mean, three <laughs> to five years is a long range ahead of us. It is, yeah. And as consumers continue to support our brand, it gives us that opportunity to test and explore. And that's what we believe is you have to test and learn. We've launched our Cashew and our Tetra with our, our partner Whole Foods. They've got an exclusivity for an amount of time. Oh, smart. Nice. And we're testing and learning. And we're talking to their shoppers and we're learning from it. So as we expand further, we're doing the right things. And we want to continue to test and learn mm -hmm. because we'll make mistakes again. 
if we think we're not going to make mistakes, we're lying to ourselves. Yeah. When you talk to the retailer, so here you are, you said you mentioned you had been exclusive with Whole Foods. What things are they telling you? And so what things are the retailers saying? These are the opportunities. This is the growth. There's an opportunity for, I'm just going to make this up, an alt milk yogurt. I have no idea. But what do they, you know, what do they see as opportunities just from a retailer perspective? Those are conversations that as we record this conversation, my team is literally having those conversations with one of the top retailers right now, yeah. looking into the future with them. Yeah. And it's having those conversations on a more strategic and not tactical dynamic sure. to give us a perspective of what they're seeing. Yeah. So I don't have the answers for you today, sure. but we're taking the action steps necessary to understand in alignment, not only with what the you know consumer data is saying, mm -hmm. but what the retailers are seeing. And then, you know, what do we see? What do we see as the opportunity? What can we actually go make a meaningful impact on? When you see all the data across your company, is there like a market that surprises you that is drinking alt milk at a clip that you're like, why? Well, LA obviously doesn't surprise you, right? Yeah, no, uh, I think New York, maybe Austin doesn't. San Francisco probably doesn't. But is there like a... Florida. Like Illinois. Okay, Florida. Florida is a hot spot. Florida. Absolutely. Where in Florida? So it's not just Miami. It's up into Tampa. It's into Orlando and even up in towards Jacksonville. So as we look at that, it was really an interesting dynamic and up into uh, Georgia with Publix. So as we look at that launch a year ago, yeah. to see the velocities be consistent across the span of 1,300 stores, mm -hmm. it's telling me that not only do we have our anchor consumers, if you think coastal, you typically have it, right? If you go New York to Miami, you do sure. Seattle down to L.A., and you get Austin in the middle, you're going to get a lot of buy-in. But as it starts to go up through the middle of Florida, as it goes into Georgia, as you know, we've got retailers in the Midwest that are doing phenomenal. Mm -hmm. So nice. there was a belief at one point that it was only the coast that would be successful with products like this. And we're seeing that shift. We're seeing consumers go, what am I actually consuming? What is this doing to my body? Yeah. Where can I make a change in what we put in our household to be more successful? And when you think about it, Obviously, you're mentioning you're a parent, and so at some point, I think naturally, as someone becomes a parent, they start to think, what are they putting into their kids' bodies? And so there's a moment of enlightenment or just more awareness as it relates to food. Is that your consumer for the most part? Is that where they're sort of meeting you? Is it the new parent, or is it just like the younger generation? Or maybe you know, some of the data could say it's, it's actually a 70-year-old grandfather. What no. are you seeing, if anything? It's not the 70-year-old grandfather. Father. Not yet. Okay. I, uh, I've tried. Uh, my, my mom is a loyalist to our chocolate almond milk. Okay. That's her favorite. She'll put that in her coffee to make her mocha. But it's not the 70 year olds. It is those newer parents, as okay. well as the 20 year olds, yeah. early 30s without kids. They're making the choices on how they're using their disposable income into products that they believe in. When I was in my 20s, it was I had beer money and the food money. <laughs> yeah. And it wasn't necessarily the best beer either. It was, you know, those were the choices I was making. And, and I reflect it, and that's where the education dynamic comes in, and it's specifically for my children, is let's look and understand how do we move our bodies? How do we exercise our bodies? How do we nourish our bodies? What choices are we making? And empowering those decisions. So when they, you know, at some point graduate, go to college and start making their own choices, that they have a wealth of knowledge that I grew up on the standard American diet. Yeah. And it's of no, I, it was what consumers were eating in the 80s and 90s. I don't think I truly learned how to nourish my body until I was in my late 30s. And even then, I, I knew it, Sure, but I wasn't doing it. It's tough, yeah. So it's, a, it's an evolution, and I think that consumers are just making more wise decisions on their food choices. I, I saw another, you guys are so, so good at the marketing. So you guys just partnered up with the Pickleball, yeah. a Pickleball League, and uh, one of your ads, it says... Uh, Let's keep the kitchen clean. Let's keep the kitchen clean. Absolutely. So good. Yeah. So good. Whoever's doing your marketing, kudos to them. I We've mean. got a great agency. It's door number three in Austin, and they are phenomenal. Yeah. And uh, shout out to them. They've been our partner. And they were actually, we interviewed them the week that it all went down with the natural flavors in 2021. And okay. we said, here's the world that we're sitting in. Oh, no way. Wow. Okay. Welcome to the jungle. Let's go. And fortunately, I'd had the chance to work with them previously, and uh, my CMO had wanted to work with them previously, and they continued to deliver for us. Do you enjoy the marketing the most? I mean, when I think about the brand, you guys crush that. And so yeah. maybe is that fun for you? It's, I mean, it's I like the offense personally, but that's yeah. me. So I'm a sales guy at heart. Okay. I love the numbers of finance. The marketing excites me. Yeah. I would never claim to be an expert marketer. Yeah. 
No, you that's know, where you just I know go who to hire. hire. <laughs> you go hire the right people. Yeah. And, and even, you know, the hardest thing was hiring a, a salesperson. And our, our chief revenue officer has just come in and she has helped us to elevate culture in the largest way and wow. built her team the way she wanted it and is making a huge impact. Yeah. So hiring the right people is everything. And then, you know, setting a, a you know, leader's intent and then giving them the autonomy to go run the play. They know where we need to get to and to support them in that journey. Any other exciting things on the marketing side besides the pickleball or anything you're doing that's interesting? So pickleball is our big bet for this year is to get out there and have the opportunity to engage at the, the tournaments. I think that's smart. Nobody else is doing that. In your we room. are the official plant-based milk of Major League Pickleball here for 2024. That's yeah, smart. Really. And we'll keep the kitchen clean both on the courts and at home. When it comes to just marketing in general, that what have you seen in terms of, it's so hard, but just what have you seen the biggest bang for your buck? Is it working with the influencers? Is it Instagram? Is it TikTok? Is it some of the pickleball ads that you're like, what's the, what have you seen dial things, move, move the needle? What helped us earliest on, so in early 2022, we were one of the initial partners with Era One in their smoothie bar. Oh, yeah. So working with the team at Era One, which is wow. an incredible team, yeah. and launching some smoothies in early 2022, you know, we've become the official uh, almond milk of their tonic bar. Wow. And to have that macro reach, we've done some interviews on the streets in Austin. It's like, have you seen this brand? It's like, oh, I've seen it on TikTok because of Era One. So we've That's leaned cool. into that partnership. That's so smart. We've leaned into meeting consumers where they are on TikTok. Yeah. Uh, it's interesting because my wife will use TikTok as her search engine. Yeah. If she wants to know something, she'll go to TikTok and ask it a question. Yeah. So if you want to ask a question about alt-based milks, almond milks, oat milks, cashew milks, and people are asking the question, well, you're going to go in there and see that we've got quite a bit of material. And we've got a fun series on there called bad additives, which we call the bad additives. Mm -hmm. Because there are a lot of other ingredients. If you don't know what it is, we can help you out. Go to our TikTok. When it comes to what you guys have in store for this year, or I hate to ask, here you are almost 10 years in, a, in the online business acquisition-wise. What do you see in the space? What do you see playing out? Obviously, we're through the CPG terror that happened, you know, emergency board meeting city last uh, year. What do you see for the future of the brand and, and ultimately to potential exit? You know... The exit is a dream for investors. I was brought in to run this company and grow it to the size that we believe it can be. It, yeah, okay. And that's my goal. Okay. My goal is to build a team and to build a company to meet where consumers are, and that's the cleanest plant-based milk there is out there. How big do you think uh, uh, your business can get? Is it like $200 million? Is it less? You know, as we look at it, um, look at any category. Yeah. There's your value portion of the SKUs. You've got your mainstream. You've got your premium. We believe that Malk is establishing the premium segment. Okay. And you can go across a lot of retailers where there is no premium segment yet established. Okay. So it's early in the, the journey for plant-based milks, especially on the premium tier. So we believe we've got a lot of blue ocean there to go establish the brand, bring it to consumers, and continue to grow that piece of the pie. Okay. In well-established categories, you can be up to 15 20% in the premium tier. Got it. And there's 1% to 2% there now. Is that your mission, would you say? Absolutely. That makes a lot of sense. Yeah. And then that simplifies the Air One type partnerships. Yeah. So the Blue Ocean, there is the premium space Correct. on the alt milks. Okay. And it's early. It is. You're seeing it's it early. very early. And so it's just, yeah, interesting. Maintaining, getting things. Yeah, just keep doing the right things. And like we talked about earlier, some of the other brands are investing a lot of marketing and bringing people from dairy into plant-based. And you love it. I love it. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Now let's talk about what they have and let's trade you up. And that's good for the consumers. It's good for the retailers. And it helps to establish that healthier dynamic and healthier product for consumers out there. Any dream collabs you'd want to do? Oh, there, there's a couple. Floyd of, Money Mayweather. I'm just thinking, like, you know, who's the, <laughs> let's think outside the box on all things. You know, we've had a lot of fun with uh, some of the Air One uh, celebrities. Sure. We, you know, we've partnered with some of the Kardashians. We've partnered with Mariana Hewitt, uh, Haley Bieber. Yeah. So as we look at that, it's not just a one shot wins. It's, you know, let's go talk to people in a broad sense. Let's give, let's give consumers the spectrum of who's drinking alt-based milks and especially the premium alt-based milks. What else should people know? What do you want to leave us with? You know, turn it around. Everything you do, look at what you're nourishing your body with, make those decisions. Sometimes you, you, know, you have to choose to invest in that product. Mm -hmm. But at the end of the day, healthy people have a thousand dreams. Mm -hmm. Unhealthy people have one dream, and that's to be healthy. Mm -hmm. So the more you can make that decision to be healthy, 
pursue those dreams. Go make those memories. Have the experiences that you want. You got to have your health to do that. Jason, I love it. Thanks for coming on the podcast. Appreciate it. Thank you so much, Diego. Thank you for tuning in. If you enjoyed this episode, share with your friends, your family, or anyone you might think might benefit from the conversation we've had today. And if you haven't already, please take a moment to leave a review on your favorite podcast platform. We'd greatly appreciate it. Your feedback helps us improve and reach more people who can benefit from our discussions. The best way to stay connected with us and get the latest updates on future episodes is through our social media channels. You can find us at Startup Storefront. We'll be back next Tuesday with another great episode. See you then.